Welcome to the first of our 2013 Subjective Histories of Sculpture lectures in our series. It's a three-part series um, that we've been doing annually since 2006. Um, Paul Pfeiffer actually gave the first one in 2006. I was looking for him, but I haven't seen him yet. Um, and the idea behind the series was to uh, ask artists to talk about not, not their work, but about, but sort of around their work, the things that they think about um, that perhaps indirectly inform their work, and maybe directly, but, um, but not so much as a, as a um, direct reference, but a way to get at the things that these artists are thinking about um, and that we might connect in different ways. So uh, I am going to do a very brief introduction to Martin, and then I'm going to turn over the mic to him. Uh, I, Martin emerged um, in the late 80s uh, as a performance artist. And, uh, <laughs> um, and this happened to be right around the time that I moved to California. Um, Martin was uh, very active in Southern California. I moved to Northern California, but um, very early in that moment I became aware of his work. And then um, in 1997, I had the pleasure of seeing a survey of his work that traveled. It was organized by Madison Art Center, if I remember, and traveled to the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts in San Francisco. And um, I was, at, just as we were talking, Byron and I were talking about the early 90s as a very formative moment in thinking about art for those of us of our generation. Um, and. Uh, what I remember about that is that performance art um, and art that dealt with issues of identity was like deadly serious then. <laughs> and so the seeing this survey of Martin's work and the way he deployed humor and really slapstick humor and sort of self-deprecating humor was like a breath of fresh air um, or a gale force wind or something. But it was really, really striking to me at the time. So I've um, followed his work ever since. Um, so the more, and just to give you the background, I think probably a lot of you are aware because you're here, but um, as I mentioned, Martin's a native of Los Angeles. He uh, studied and received both his BFA and his MFA from uh, UCLA. And um, then he's uh, taught at CalArts for quite some time, and which made him, in addition to his uh, work and being known for his work as a, he became quite influential, I think, in a, for a lot of artists that came up through LA at that, in, over the last decade or so. Um, he has had exhibitions all over the world, including the Kunsthalle of Bern. Um, there was a retrospective of his work that was co-organized by the Santa Monica Museum and the Tang Museum. That was in 2008. Mm -hmm. 2007 and 8. Um, and his work is in the collection of uh, LACMA, Mocha LA, uh, the Whitney, the Pompidou, and he's been in two or three Whitney biennials. Um, so I think many of you are probably more or less familiar with his work. We are very excited that he is now um, on the East Coast as his current uh, academic position is as an associate professor and um, director of the graduate studies in sculpture at Yale. So please join me in welcoming Martin Kersels. Thank you, Mary, and thank you to the new, the new school and to, oh, hello, Michael, and, uh, and to the Sculpture Center. I might just do this. Like, be a little more comfortable. Uh, this was seemed like a very uh, easy project at first when Mary talked about it. It's like, oh, my other interests. And then it became sort of more difficult to actually sort of hone down to one interest that I sort of could talk about, not in depth, but at least give some sort of, you know, hour long lecture or hour long presentation. And uh, uh, I, thought about all sorts of different things and all sorts of different interests, but then what it came down to, it, was, had, it became about uh, uh, cars. <laughs> 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 uh, 
Um, I want to start by saying that I was born and raised in Los Angeles, uh, which uh, for those of you who've been there, it's just all sorts of miles and miles of concrete and asphalt and tons of cars. I think, you know, as many cars as people. Um, and, and it's like, and I grew up with the sort of like, why walk when you can drive attitude. And, uh, and so when I travel, I know when I travel, I know I have this kind of problem. Because when I travel to a city that, say, if I'm doing an installation for a couple of weeks in a city that I don't have a car, at first I feel like I'm un unburdened and untethered. But then after a week, I feel I'm imprisoned. And, uh, and I really need to be driving because I believe it's, it's, it's not just about the car, it's about control. <laughs> and, and it's a situation for me of creating privacy within the public sphere. And, uh, and like, the, like a lot of neuroses, it started in childhood. Um, my parents were born in Europe, <laughs> Latvia to be precise. Both were raised in families without cars because they didn't need any uh, trams, buses, and the cities weren't really giant sprawls. But once they moved to the United States post-World War II, uh, they took to driving like natives. They really liked the idea of expanses and covering huge chunks of land at, a, at their own pace, at their own clip. Um, so my parents both worked, and, but we always had one family car. And it was always used and always functional. My dad wasn't, he, he knew mechanics pretty well. He wasn't a mechanic, but he could service a car and he could uh, drop an engine and do those kind of things. So um, this is a Volvo P544. Uh, uh, I think this is, was produced from 58 to 66. And um, this is the, I think, remember the first car I remember ever driving in. And my mom liked it. It had a stick shift, uh, like three on a tree. People know what that means? A column shift. Uh, and she liked it because she could, uh, uh, when she ran out of gas, she could she can glide into gas stations and stuff like that. And so this was the family car until basically my younger sister, I'm, I'm one of three kids, younger sister was born. And then we got the station wagon. And this is a 1964 Colony Park. Um, it, it has a, let's see. Uh, let's see, it has a, a V8 engine. It has a rear facing third seat, fake wood paneling, roof rack. Uh, this isn't the actual car. The other one was like gold instead of white and didn't have those like mag wheels on it that these do. And uh, my dad uh, worked for a man who collected cars. And I grew up around classic and old cars. Uh, also, because he was around cars all the time, he could get good deals. And so this was, a, I believe, a used car that we had. And uh, like today's, the cars of the 50s, 60s, and 70s are collectible. But this was the early 70s in the wheelhouse for collecting at that time were cars from the 20s, 30s, and 40s. So uh, again, the 64 uh, Mercury Colony Park. Uh, let's see. Uh, I have really kind of two memories that are really associated with this car. One is that when my sister started driving, this was the car she learned how to drive. And I remember she jumped in the car at 16 and just slammed on, I mean, uh, just put her pedal to the metal and started it and blew all the rods in the engine. <laughs> just totally, and I remember that was sort of this big trauma within the family structure that my sister <laughs> killed the car. And my dad, not being, not being like wealthy, he actually decided he was going to uh, rebuild the engine himself, and he did but it took him like a month of Saturdays or something to do that. The second uh, memory is I was driving with my mom when the brakes failed on this car. And I remember 
I have this mental image of watching the car in front of us, which actually had another station wagon with rear-facing seats, and two young little girls looking at the car as we're just getting closer and closer, and their faces going from, we're happy kids, to ah! And thankfully, no one was hurt. Uh, but that was, that's the Colony Park. Um, my dad's boss gave him a bonus one year of this car, which is a 1940 Ford convertible sedan, I mean a coupe, with, uh, again, a V8 engine, but I think it only ran on seven cylinders, a pneumatic roof that folded back, a three, again, a three-speed uh, manual transmission, and uh, these fake white walls. They look like white walls on the tire, but they're actually, materially, they're very weird. They actually were, f like, you, they were like, like rubber flaps, and you can kind of peel them back. So they're more like adhesive than they are part of the actual structure. So uh, this sat in the garage a lot. It was not the daily driver. It was something that was a da my dad's project car. And I remember sitting in the driver's seat from about the age 14 on until I actually drove, uh, sitting and practicing shifting and steering. So shifting the clutching, you know, dry clutching and shifting, and just doing that uh, because I felt closer to the to the act of driving that I was going to be at some point within this history. Oh, and I made car noises. <laughs> Always shifting. Um, I sat a lot in that Ford, but this is the car I actually learned to drive on. It's a 1965 Lincoln Continental convertible. So I, this is 65, but I learned in 76. So it was already some years old. Uh, large V8, uh, soggy, if people know Ford, Lincoln Mercury products, soggy power steering, like you could, you could like drive and still be going straight. <laughs> really, really, really soft mushy brakes, so you feel like if you slammed, you would like stop really quickly, but you're kind of going, there's a lot of weight that's coming to, uh, coming to stop. It's like a lot of weight, and it felt mushy. It sort of felt like oatmeal in, on your feet or something like that. Uh, the, it, it, but it had this automatic roof that was electric, not pneumatic, but electric, that was really awesome because it, it just, it, the trunk opened automatically. This is the orientation. It's not opening like a trunk this way. It's opening this way. And then the top would retract. And then fold in. And then the trunk would go, lid would go. That's it screwing itself down. Uh, and it had smooth leather seats, like just slidey. It's like it was really slidey on the butt. Like it was really nice. And then suicide doors. Which, do people know what suicide doors are? Yeah. Who can explain? They open into the wind. Say it loudly, please. They open oh, into on. the... <laughs> they open into the wind. What does that mean? Um, please, I... Like, is it of, like... They open opposite of normal doors, so if you're driving the rear window, the rear door would... Open. Wait, so you have to come up here and explain it. Come on. <laughs> so can we have two people? Can I have two people come up? Two people now. Come on, maybe. Okay. <laughs> okay. 
Now you stand okay. like this, and you're a door. Okay. Maybe, maybe raise your arm. Put your elbows out a little bit like this. Like, oh, stand akimbo. So maybe is the front door, and Virginia is the back door, so to speak. Now, how does it work? Okay, so the normal door, with the, the front seat door would open this way as your custom. Uh, the suicide door is on the back, and it opens this way. And I believe they're called suicide doors because if you're driving along and the door opens accidentally, the wind will catch it and not only rip the door off, probably you will get pulled out along. What's with this wind thing? Yeah, I've been afraid of, like, wait, then Virginia, you have to come back here. No, okay, open the door again. We need another person. We need another person. Okay, pretend you're not the wind. I'm sorry, what's your name? Charlie. Charlie, it's nice to, to show, but you're a car. Now you're coming, and Charlie, stand like you're getting out of the car here. Like you're sitting facing this way because that's the way. Yeah, Charlie, open the door, and you're the car, and you go, wham! That's the car, it's the car, another car hitting you. Sorry, if you, if you have a child in the back seat and they accidentally pull the door handle, the wind, and it, even if it opens an inch, the wind will catch it and fling the door open the full, Wait, where if you're on the front seat, normal doors, the wind flow will actually slam the door back shut. Okay. Charlie, okay, now I finally understand the wind. So thank you to all our volunteers. Yeah. The wind is about, the wind when you're driving. I just thought you're sort of sitting somewhere and a wind comes up, <laughs> like a zephyry kind of breeze in the summer. Oh, the wind. Oh, it's making the door so dangerous. <laughs> OK, where was I? <laughs> OK, oh, yeah, so um, the other thing that this, this car is, this, it's, the, it's a relative of the car that, uh, that carried JFK on November 23rd, 1963. That was a limousine version but it had the same why he was sitting is because the roof, the rear deck was smooth because the roof went into the trunk. That's why he was sitting up. Uh, touch and desire. Um, so um, I worked, my dad, I said, as I said, my dad worked for a man who collected old cars. Um, but his boss had so many that he also was selling them. So he had this place called Old Time Cars. And I would, from the age of about 12, 13, 14, work on some Saturdays. And work, I say, with quotes, air quotes. If people did air quotes in 1973, I would be, that's what I'd be doing. And so my work would be on Saturdays and would, and it would, my jobs were reading, eating lunch, napping, and occasionally dusting and waxing the cars. And I remember cars like this, this is a 1941 Packard convertible sedan, I think. And I remember the smooth, rubbing wax or rubbing dust off the smooth feathers, the fenders, the long lines, the curves, the, the, uh, the long hoods that you, could, that you had to reach over and your body became in contact with this, with this machine. But it was warm because you had just waxed it and rubbed it. And there was this intimacy that a 13-year-old didn't understand. <laughs> And he went home and just was confused and cried in bed as he didn't know that rubbing his body all over a car wasn't really what love was about. Um, but I also, there was a smell aspect to working at old time cars. And that was this kind of uh, industrial yet attractive uh, smell of 
oil, gasoline, leaded gasoline, uh, old leather and worn rubber. It sort of sounds like a club. <laughs> old leather and warm rubber, worn rubber. Um, but I, I, I still, when I smell that, it's very nostalgic, very nostalgic, and I go home and cry yet again. Uh, but through Old Time Cars, I got to meet celebrities, believe it or not. So I remember meeting Neil Young around 73, and he was looking for something similar to this 41 pack. I also met uh, Steve McQueen, who bought a truck like this 51 Chevy. And Wayne Newton, who was a big star in Vegas at the time, and he wanted a 32 Duesenberg. This is, I think, a 31. Um, I really liked the cars of the 30s. Um, as you see, there's a car from the maybe early 20s behind it. And within that 10 year span, it was a, quite, a, quite a shift of just technologies of produce, production, but also design sensibility. And like I was talking about those fenders and those lines that kind of mimicked speed or the rumbles of like, uh, they actually, Cadillac had some V16 engines, small displacement, but still big, long engines that had, that just sounded so smooth and yet so powerful at the same time. This was one of my favorite cars that I had ever seen in person. This is a 31 Auburn boat tail speedster. And it's called a boat tail because the back end, you can't see it here, comes to a point. Like a, actually more like a prow of a boat. Uh, but it's really, it's quite a beautiful car. Well, rubber and road, I guess where rubber meets the road. Well, I liked classic cars, and it was also a way for me personally to uh, hang with my dad on Saturdays, and also to kind of think about uh, design. Uh, I, of course, could not afford any such things when I had my own cars. so. Uh, mine were more economical and not quite so classic, so I will run through them. Uh, a 1968 Opel Cadet was my first car. Uh, we called it the Stink Bug. <laughs> that was its nickname. A little two-door Opel was a, car, a German car manufacturer that was trying to compete with Volkswagen in the kind of the low-end economy market. Um, 1968 Volvo 142. Um, this was uh, all. This nickname was the Gray Ghost. Um, this is not the actual car, but it was uh, my. I guess revisiting cars my my parent, my mom drove by having my own Volvo, and Volvo had uh, the 142 meant the series was a one, the four was it was four cylinders and the two was that it was two door. Uh, a 1975 Volvo 245 uh, station wagon. This is, I was in college at the time, and it was a great car to have as a young artist in college because I could carry all sorts of materials and uh, it, uh, I really fucked it up a lot with putting stuff in it. And so 245 is a series, um, four is cylinders again, and five is the doors, number of doors. Uh, 1982 Datsun King Cab, not a Nissan, but a Datsun. This was a hand-me-down from my uh, wife's 
father. He had installed a moo horn, a moo horn on it. That was a handle to the left. And when you raised it, it had a diaphragm somewhere in the engine. And it would go, Marr, Marr. And he liked to, he liked to, he lived up in Northern California and he liked to drive by fields and moo at the cows and see if he could get them to respond. Uh, uh, a 2000, 1992 Toyota Extra Cab. This I actually was my first new car I'd ever bought. Uh, again, I was in school. Uh, no, I was between school, uh, between undergraduate and graduate when I got this. And but I was doing a lot of performance at the time and carrying platforms and props and things like that. And it was a great car to have. A 2001 Silverado 1500 uh, with uh, extra cab. These back, the doors behind the main doors opened. And uh, it was, uh, I thought, oh, I need a roomy big American truck. Until gas really started going up. And then the car that I have now still is a 2004 Toyota Matrix which I have a roof rack, and I've driven 180,000 miles at this point. Um, as an artist, I've been interested in failure uh, a, a lot. I feel like that kind of goes through my work. Um, not necessarily catastrophic failure. Um, but failure, the small, intimate, personal, sideways, glancing failure that uh, produces um, humor and pain is what I really like if it's, if it's functioning at its best. Um, so these are failed cars, failed autos, and one car actually became synonymous with failure, and that was the Edsel, the Ford Edsel. And uh, this is from, uh, let's see, I think this is a, a 1957 Ford Edsel. It only was produced for a few years. And Ford, Edsel Ford was Henry Ford's only male, uh, only son. And he never got to be the president of Ford Motor Company. That went to Edsel's son, Henry II. And when Henry II, but Edsel Ford was very popular with workers. He was an engineer and a businessman. And when Henry Ford, they decided to make a car, there was some talk about making it called the Edsel. And so the family sort of was for it, sort of against it. Sometimes they seemed like there was something that they wanted to do. But the Edsel itself was a mistake or a failure in timing. The zeitgeist of the time was moving away from kind of these large uh, status mobiles a little bit. And also that the name wasn't, a, the styling wasn't good. They called that front grill a horse collar grill. And people thought it was just too, too weird in the time of the of that time in the in the late 50s, and so Ford lost 250 million dollars, which in today's market would be two billion dollars. So, um, the but the Edsel name, going back to that, the Edsel name itself was uh, was bandied about, and they didn't quite want to name it that, but they didn't know what else. So they hired a marketing firm to come up with other names. And that marketing firm came up with 18,000 different names of what to call the car. But then Henry II actually asked Marianne Moore, a Pulitzer Prize winning poet, to come up with some names for her, for the car. So. Can you hear me? OK, so let's see. One name is 
the silver sword. Hurricane Acepitor. The Ford Fabergé. <laughs> the Aliform. The Pastelogram. <laughs> the Varsity Stroke. <laughs> the Cresta Lark. The Pluma Palima. And Utopian Turtle. <laughs> They didn't choose any of those. <laughs> but they had a list to go by. Uh, the Yugo from the 1980s. <laughs> People know yeah. of the Yugo? Yeah. So what's included in, in every Yugo owner's manual? A bus schedule. <laughs> What do you call a Yugo that breaks down after 100 miles? An overachiever. <laughs> and why does a Yugo have a rear window defroster? So you can keep your hands warm while you push it. <laughs> the 2004 Pontiac Aztec was GM's first effort, or General Motors' first effort to make a crossover, trying to attract young drivers on the go. And Motor Trend actually, Motor Trend and all the car uh, monthlies, Motor Trend, Car and Driver, Automobile, actually kind of liked it. Uh, they, they thought it was ugly styling, but there was a certain kind of functionality until they actually uh, put down the hash pipe and then really looked at it <laughs> and said it was totally the most ugly, one of the most ugly things on the road. Speaking of crack, uh, the 1981 DeLorean DMC-12. So this is the car you might remember from, uh, well, so here we are. We introduce John DeLorean. And you might remember this car from Back to the Future, uh, Marty McFly and Dr. Emmett Brown, and how it, because of the, was made of, stainless steel components that it was the flux capacitor would work and when able to make a time travel right so the the person or the person behind the delorean was john delorean and he started at packard not as a designer but like the car company do people does anyone understand how the car company works how auto manufacturing works i mean there are designers and there are kind of stylists and big designers like uh, uh, who might have a large kind of overview of something, but then there are like component designers and it's their teams. And so what DeLorean was, was sort of ran the team that, I, that went between design and engineering and marketing and to, to, to kind of create not just the car, but how the car would function within the world and how it would be perceived create the car image, right? Not just the car, but the car image. And DeLorean was quite good at this. He started with GM at Pontiac, and this is the Grand Prix that he uh, retooled and restyled. I think he created, actually. Uh, but he really became known for the GTO, which uh, was a uh, Pontiac's first, or GM's first muscle car. And, uh, and that became like his calling card to be the man, or one of the mans. Man, men, mans? <laughs> Become one of the mans in Detroit. Uh, because I'm sorry, there wasn't a woman's thing, as you probably know. It was a man's uh, highball drinking world. And, and this car allowed him a lot of freedom within GM. Uh, he wanted to create, a, that's him there again. He wanted to create a car called the Banshee, which is a, maybe he should have hired Mary Ann 
what's her name to come up with some other names beside the banshee. But the GM bosses said no, because they, again, being a corporation, they didn't want the, their own company to compete with their Corvette or something. So um, he instead was given a Camaro in order to redesign the front and rear and then came up with the Firebird. And so this is the Firebird, which, so people know what a Camaro and a Firebird look like, right? They look a similar, right? Except their front and rear are kind of different. The insides are all the same. Like a, box, a car is like a three box proposition, right? It's sort of like the, the, the middle, the rear deck, and the front, like in most cases. Something like a van might be a, a one box car or something that might be like a station wagon would be maybe a two box. So he basically just dealt with the box one and box two and, and made the car that eventually allowed Burt Reynolds to become a star in Smokey and the Bandit. So anyway, he, he, worked, he worked a lot, uh, you know, but then he got tired of, I think, the corporate politics at GM and went out on his own. That's one way to look at it. At least that's the, the history book way of looking at how he did. And he started the DeLorean Motor Car Company or the DeLorean Motor Company. And he created on a basically, I think, a, uh, an Al, uh, I mean, a Renault platform, uh, a car built with fiberglass bodies panels covered in non in non uh, structural stainless steel with gull wing doors. Oh, I just got an email. <laughs> I wonder who it's from. <laughs> no, I'll be thinking about that the whole time. Um, so the DeLorean was built in Derry, uh, Northern Ireland, uh, because the politics of making your own car is that you need lots of money to build a factory. And the Irish government was ready to pony up a, a lot of money for him to build a car there because, again, he was the man or one of the men's. And so this car became very, very, very famous. But it was not a great car, actually, even though it had it, the, the stainless steel body didn't really serve a purpose. If it got dinged, you have to replace panels. The fit and finish in, inside wasn't always the best. It was a little underpowered. Uh, I got to drive in one several times because the, uh, someone I knew had one. And there was something about being in one that people really stood up and paid attention. But it wasn't a special driving experience. So the car company started to fail. and But DeLorean didn't want it to fail because it was his company. So he. Uh, try to figure out a way to save it. And one was to be entrapped by the government. Uh, this is DeLorean saying, it's good as gold. Gold weighs more for this, for heaven's sake. They're talking about 200 pounds of cocaine. And he was arrested for trafficking, even though there actually wasn't ever a sale. And the government had, in, had literally really forced him into this position where he was going to sell them cocaine that I don't think he even had. Like it was this whole, um, well, a kind of a government fuck up to try to trap John DeLorean because he was trying to save his company. So this is, I, I had this one, I put this one in because I really like that he says, will he get off? <laughs> I thought that was nice on people. So, but he was found not guilty in Los Angeles and he, uh, it was felt vindicated, but at the same time, the car company uh, failed, went down the tubes. But the DeLorean itself, besides the uh, Back to the Future movies, other people did things with DeLoreans. <laughs> Nike just recently, in 2010, produced these shoes, the 6.0 Dunk SE. These are based on the DeLorean. Uh, a coffin. <laughs> So the, it, it, as a car, it has, Ferrari might have a long shadow because of its 
situation of winning races, of its place within culture of Italia, of speed, of, of romance. But the DeLorean has its own kind of special place in our culture. The 1960 Corvair, uh, it was the only production model car that had a rear engine air cooled, and uh, rear only car, American produced car that had a rear engine air cooled. Air, air cooled rear engine. <laughs> so I put it, the, finally put them in the right order. <laughs> Is it Charlie? Did I say it right? Yeah. OK, thank you. Um, it was uh, General Motors wanted to compete with uh, uh, the Ford Falcon, the Plymouth Valiant Dodge Dart variant, the, the Beetle, to make a small car that had a little pep, a little handling, a little sportiness, but not too scary, not like a Porsche, not uh, not like a Ferrari or a Lotus or a Triumph a Herald or a Jensen Interceptor or all those other kind of cars. But this car was singled out by Ralph Nader uh, in his book, It's Unsafe at Any Speed. And it did not have a, it, it was, it had this weird suspension that was a, a swing axle, axle suspension that was supposed to make it ride smoother, but potentially because it didn't have a sway bar. It was supposedly, at speed, could flip very easy. But the, the thing was, um, and, and Ralph Nader, uh, because of this, the, the, he basically, uh, this book killed this car, not to say it needed to be killed, or it should have been killed, or should not have been killed. 
but a 1972 report, uh, this is way after the fact, found that actually it had the same kind of uh, stability as most cars made at the time. So I don't know why this car had, had his attention, but uh, it did, and it had lots of controversy and demise. Uh, this is a 1971 Ford Maverick. Uh, I just personally, I remember that the Ford Maverick, again, was sort of supposed to be a car that was uh, supposed to compete on the low end of the market. Very bad fit and finish, very plasticky. Uh, the rear windows didn't roll down at all. That saved a lot of money. But uh, I remember it also had great, it was a real smogger. And if people remember growing up in America at that time that you would see cars just billowing smoke and you'd follow them and it was like everything just seemed normal. And so when you see a car like that today, it's sort of crazy. But I remember as a kid that I saw a funeral in a, no, I don't remember where it was. I think it was in a local park where they dug a hole and buried a maverick in it <laughs> because it's time for clean air. This is California, of course. Um, Rodney King. Uh, in the early hours of March 3rd, 1991, um, Rodney King was, Rodney King, a friend and a friend in the back were in this 1988 Hyundai Excel. And this is a recreation photograph. This is not the actual original chase. And the highway patrol people in the original case testified that Rodney King's car was swerving and driving at excess speeds of 115 miles per hour. <laughs> and uh, as they were driving through places uh, along the Foothill Freeway into Hunga and then eventually off the freeway in Sunland in that area, uh, the LAPD caught up with him. Uh, near Lakeview Terrace and then beat him and tased him twice, and kicked him about 58 times and clubbed him. And uh, this was this booking photo of the time. And I, I don't want to, I'm not making light of this, but the whole, I'm not going to say the whole case is built upon this car was, is it able to go 115 miles per hour? The car only had 68 horsepower. Today's uh, Fiat, uh, the Cinquecento, the new Cinquecento, uh, has 101 horsepower. But at that time, even Hyundai engineers couldn't believe that it could go faster than 85. Motor Trend car and driver did tests of how long it took to get to 85 miles an hour, and it took at least four or five minutes for it to get up to that speed. And the whole chase was only about eight minutes long. It wasn't one of these long car chases that we see now. So this whole, Rodney King himself did say that he was speeding, he was weaving, he was afraid because he had just been recently released that if he, a speeding ticket would have put him back in jail, would have violated his parole, which is not true. Uh, but this whole, this whole incident around this Hyundai Excel and Rodney King and the uh, racist behavior of the LAPD created a situation of uh, in, in uh, uh, 1992 after Stacey Kuhn and other LAPD uh, officers were uh, acquitted a uh, the LA riots with uh, 53 people killed, over 2,000 people injured, and uh, about $1 billion in property damage. Visionary. Um, this is, this is uh, uh, Buckminster Fuller's car, the Damaxian car. And he, labeled a lot of things Dymaxians, like a house and other things. But this is the car, which is based on uh, principles of aerodynamics. But he also wanted to make a car that was 
had a great fuel economy. This is from 19, uh, uh, it's from 1933. Uh, it could seat 11 people, 30 miles to the gallon. It had this rear wheel. It's steered from the rear. It was a three-wheeler. And it could turn on itself. So it could just sort of almost like pivot. So it had this amazing turning radius. And it was going to be, and it was made for a World's Fair, but when it was in the World's Fair, it crashed and killed somebody. <laughs> so it didn't really make much of an impression. Uh, they made three of them. One was badly damaged in that uh, initial accident. One belongs in the museum, the Harris Auto Museum. And then one was, I think, uh, damaged and salvaged for scrap in 53. And uh, Norman Foster recently, and I think this is that Norman Foster one, uh, re had one built, or built one, a fourth one. The AMC Pacer. I put this in for my friend Melinda, especially, because uh, Rudy Perez, the Judson Church choreographer, when he was in LA, this is what he drove. We called it the Rudy Mobile. But it was, a, it was an interesting car at this time because this is, a, again, we're back to the two or three boxes. This is a two box car when most cars at the time were three box cars. And it was as wide as a normal sedan, but shorter. So it was sort of square. It was like a brownie or something. It was like a, a carrot cake bar or something. Uh, and there are a lot of them in Britain. So this is from 1961. Uh, it had two propellers in the rear and you can just drive it right off the road and into a body of water. And, and you can uh, uh, boat with it. Now, there are 4,000 total sold in about six years. Some said it was the fastest car on water or the fastest boat on the highway. <laughs> Someone else called it a study in slow drowning. <laughs> The Ford Pinto. Now, um, the Ford Pinto, visionary, um, it, it sold nearly three million, uh, three million units for Ford. It was Lee Iacocca, another dude, uh, who was involved with the original Mustang. He wanted to build a car that was under 2,000 pounds and under $2,000. Again, this is during the you know, beginnings of the oil uh, 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 OPEC and then oil embargoes and gas prices rising and um, it, it's, it's one of its taglines was a little carefree car to put a little kick in your life and they used Pinto because the Mustang was the more popular muscle or pony car and they used Pinto here now Pinto the Pinto was also known as uh, the barbecue that seats four. <laughs> this is a still from the movie Top Secret, where the joke is um, that these German, this takes place in World War II, these German SS guys are driving around and they're chasing somebody, and then they get off the road and they head towards the Pinto, and they just barely touch it and everyone explodes. <laughs> um, there were a lot of fires with the Ford Pinto. There's an issue with uh, it, it, at the time, with a lot of cars, that the gasoline tank was behind the rear axle. Now, it's mandatory that it's in front of the rear axle. Uh, and they had an overfill valve or something that would, if, if, if ding, would, would leak and then cause the car to ignite on fire. <laughs> wasn't, wasn't so good. So, but, so this is not, the, this is not why, why I'm thinking it's visionary. I'm thinking about... Um, Henry uh, Smolinski, and Henry Smolinski is an aviation and aeronautical engineer, and he had an idea, and, and what could go, going back to the 2,000 pounds, that if he had a light enough car, he could make a plane, an aero car, or a flying car. And the idea was that you would drive your car to the airport, and just back it up to this 
this uh, wing engine system and then fly to a destination. <laughs> what do you, do you, do you park a plane? What do you do? Plan. It's not, you don't dock a plane, do you? What's the, you taxi is the moving. But how, do you, how do you store it? You hanger it? Well, you park it. Because it's a car, actually, right? <laughs> you dock your, wait, it's the amp car. Uh, okay, so anyway, you go to the place where you want to go, you unhook everything, and you drive off. He had said what his, this quote, our plan is to make the operation so simple that a woman can easily put the two systems together or separate them without help. And I suppose they mean both physical help and mental help. <laughs> I think he was thinking that, maybe. So this is, he's doing this in uh, the early 70s. Um, and he, uh, so he, the plane he decided to use was the Cessna Skymaster. And the Skymaster was known, it had two engines, one in, uh, uh, pointed back, you see up here, and then one forward. He removed the forward one and left the back one. You see, this is the engine with the propeller. He added instrumentation, a collapsing steering wheel that acted like, a, like a planar controls and um, wanted to produce, in the first year, he wanted to produce 12,000 of these that would sell, let's see, about $18,000. The idea was for $18,000, you could have, they called it the, what's, how do you pronounce M-I-Z-A-R? Mizar? Not the Mizar, Mizar, Mizar? The Mizar, which is a star in the handle of the Big Dipper. Not a very good name, I think. I think he needs some help. But anyway, he, um, they called it the Mazar, and he would also sell just the, the car, too. So like, say, you had a family that wanted to fly, your daughter or your son, one, yeah, daughter could do it, yeah, because she didn't need help. Um, um, the son or the daughter could have their car, which would sell for $5,700, and just fly to the, to the unit, use it, and then leave it for the parents to use or whatever. And so he, he really worked at this, and they actually got it in the air. And they did test flights at Van Nuys Airport in the early 70s, and they were getting to a place where they, uh, they were ready to, to do certification testing and do long-term testing, uh, uh, great lengthy testing, and uh, one day the Smolinski and his VP, Hal Blake, went up, and uh, uh, the struts, which are attached to the sides, collapsed, and he crashed. And uh, there have been many, and so this, the aero car, the Pinto aero car, died with him because the company's board of directors decided it was not cost effective. Uh, there have been many others who have uh, tried to make aero cars, but the thinking is, and it's just sort of how one thinks about stuff, that instead of making a car that flies, they're thinking about making a plane that drives, right? It's like a shift of, like it's easier to make a, something that's aerodynamic because the, the thing with, with this is that it's like flying a two by four or something. Do you know what I mean? Like these wheels hang down. Uh, there's a, it, it's square. There's no aerodynamic sensibility. Maybe they could have used a Dymaxion. That would have worked better. But anyway, all that drag really made this not a good proposition. Um, In 1955, James Dean had released one film, which was uh, 
was Rebel Without a uh, No, East of Eden. He had released East of Eden. He had shot Rebel Without a Cause, and he was in the process of shooting Giant. But they hadn't been released yet. But he was into speed, uh, motorcycles, cars. But he gave up his motorcycles, and he bought himself a Porsche. And he started to do club racing. He was an aggressive driver, uh, go into hay bales, drive contact fender to fender. And he, in, in 1955, he bought a, uh, let's see, it's called a Porsche 550 Spider. Um, uh, and I go, it was the 55th of 90 that Porsche built. So the serial number was 550-055, just as a numerology thing. So he, he bought this spider from Com Competition Motors in Hollywood, and he immediately decided he would road race it at Salinas. And he um, went, to, went to Dean Jeffries, which was a, a, uh, an up-and-coming pinstriper person, and had the numbers for Salinas painted on the car, front, back, two doors, in washable paint. And then the uh, sobriquin, sobriquin little bastard on the back, which goes to either that he thought the car was a little bastard because it was so powerful for such a little car, or Jack Warner had actually called him a little bastard at one point. Um, so he and on the day, a few days before the race, instead of uh, towing the car, because he, he also had bought a uh, Ford station wagon and trailer to tow it to races, they decided, uh, uh, it was decided that the car needed some breaking in. So this is uh, uh, Wolf, uh, Rolf Wutherich, who was a, a Porsche, uh, from Germany, a Porsche mechanic, a racing mechanic sent to set up the car. And with a person following with a trailer, on September 30th, they set off to go to Salinas. Um, this is the car, this is the last uh, picture of the car, I think taken by um, Bill Hickman, who was following in the, in the tow car. At 554 on Highway 446, 466, he crashed into Donald Turnup Seeds' 1950 Ford Custom. Custom the, is a huge, heavy car, but it went spinning down the highway for about 40 or 50 feet. Um, and uh, the Porsche was creamed. Uh, James Dean was pinned inside. Rolf was thrown from the car, survived. James Dean was uh, pronounced dead at the scene. Um, there's a lot of conspiracy theory surrounding this uh, crash that actually Rolf was driving, uh, turn up seed, meant to, to knock the car out, uh, that there wasn't, James Dean is actually alive. He's not dead. He's still alive someplace. Um, and, and there's a whole, this, this kind of cottage industry sprang up fairly soon, though he wasn't yet famous as he is actually today at that point, because like I said, Giant and Rebel Without a Cause hadn't been released yet. Uh, eventually, the, hand, the car wound up the car, at some certain points, was parted out. Because it was a racing car, not just a street, uh, everyday driver, parts of it were actually used by other racers who had, would buy the rear differential or would buy some sort of uh, other part of suspension that wasn't destroyed. Uh, but the bulk of it, apparently, or what was left, supposedly wound up in the hands of Chuck Barris. Uh, Chuck Barris, you may know, uh, as uh, the guy who invented the gong show, but he was also, uh, he was also, he was a car customizer who designed the original Batmobile and also I believe the original Munster's car. And he had, 
And he basically, if you look at this car here, and then you look at this is the car that they said is the James Dean death car, but it was really basically a ginned up car to make it look like it was the James Dean car, but it wasn't really, and it was put out to, for, to raise money, so to speak, for Barris, lent out. But he also wrote books and talked about, created this whole curse surrounding the James Dean car, that someone who took a part from it, uh, used it in their car, died when the car overturned, or someone who tried to steal the steering wheel of the car, broke their arm, or the tow truck driver, the car fell on him. And this whole kind of industry, this sort of a, the, the the, fascina the fascination and the, the fear that is created by tragedy went to making this sort of glowing situation of, of conspiracy, of, uh, of voodoo, magic, of all sorts of things that went with it. Um, ironically, while he was shooting Giant, um, uh, James Dean shot a public service announcement with Gig Young, and at the end, his last line was, uh, take it easy driving, the life you save might be mine. Um, I want to end with, want to end with uh, other types of, of visionaries here, um, which if you, if I Googled redneck autos and I included uh, things that I thought were interestingly created, personal visions that unlike, say, the, uh, the, the Dymaxion or even the Ford Pinto that flew, uh, that those are about sort of changing culture in some way. This is sort of someone's own personal expression. I end with this. Thank you. I, I, if there are questions, I will, of course, answer them. Yes. Okay, I, I got here late, so uh, I didn't see the beginning of your presentation. I got, I came in with the Edsel, uh, appropriately perhaps, on the screen. But there are several car models that came immediately to mind that would have been apropos for your talk. One is the Bricklin. Yes. Uh, yeah. Another is the Izetta. Uh, MW. Uh, yeah. uh, Raymond Lowy's Avanti. And uh, Crosley Motors out of Cincinnati. Did you cover any of those or not? Or I did not. They were on my original list. I could have made uh, an amazing list of cars, the, like the Brickman, which was the, an amazing story about the, the, uh, that he was trying to make the car company. And there's this really amazing picture because he was a transvestite also standing like in front of his car that he said was a factory, but it, well, there wasn't a factory. It's just sort of an, an amazing story. There's a lot of these stories. I, I just sort of picked ones that I felt were resonated with uh, my practice as an artist, or ones that I felt sort of had some sort of harmony with it. But thank you. The question was, how many traffic offenses have I had? Moving violations? Are you, like speeding tickets and running red lights or accidents? 
Okay. One, two, two. Fairly minor. I had a, someone doored me, like if I had been a suicide door, it would have been hurt, but instead it just pulled the door away. And I ran, I rear-ended. Do you know, um, do you know that movie, uh, uh, Little Miss Sunshine? I, um, I knew Valerie Ferris as one of the directors, and I was in a performance that she did, this is a years ago, and I rear-ended her. <laughs> Like really hard. I mean, it was really horrible. Like I, she had to wear a neck brace. It was horrible. I mean, it was minor, but it was also like that was, you know, one of those whiplash things. And that's why she didn't invite me to the premiere. <laughs> The question was about sound influencing me, it's the sound of cars or sounds around cars. Or, um, the, I remember one of the loudest things I'd ever been to as, a, as an early teen was a drag race at the Winter Nationals in Ontario Motor Speedway. And I couldn't believe like how loud that was. I mean, I've been to a Glen Bronca concert and it was way, way louder than a Glen Bronca concert. And, and, and that's sort of like, for me, that's sort of like a pinnacle, you know? Um, and I've been afraid of that kind of sound and I've tried not to make things, I, I, I'm afraid of making it too loud because I scare myself. So in a way, cars are kind of brutal sounding to me at times. And I like ideas surrounding uh, car sounds like that Mazda tuned its original um, RX-7 to sound like a British sports car, right? So they tuned its, its, um, its, its, its uh, emissions and everything and its muffler and its piping to sound like a car that was like from the 1960s from another continent. And I like that idea that they thought about that, right? That they thought about creating something that would that would it wasn't just about a style a visual styling cue like the i like um uh the the dodge viper trying to look like a ferrari 250 gto or something like that it was sort of about the sound and i really those kind of things are interesting to me yes Money is no object, and practicality is not an issue. What car or cars would you own now? A splashy. I, I really want a splashy. <laughs> because, you know, I, I was actually thinking that it would be like go into the Long Island Sound. I can go visit Jay. <laughs> I could like just, I would be like, oh, I can go to Point Orient or something. Like, I feel like it would be a really great car. That's, I think a splashy would be a car. Um, and probably I would also, what are you laughing at? Um, I would also maybe, um, uh, I would like to have, I know I couldn't drive it, I'm too big, would be like a, a, a Ferrari, like a, a, a the Ferrari Daytona, which is a really beautiful car. Yes. Um, I was just wondering why you included pictures of Tiger Woods, just out of curiosity. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, this is uh, what I did. I just took my last lecture that I had made at NYU, and I just put images over. <laughs> like I put the car images over. So the last thing with Tiger Woods is all about this conspiracy theory about Tiger Woods being actually mind control, like being mind controlled. I don't know if you guys want to hear any of this. I kind of do, actually. Well, I'll just tell you the, the, briefest, the briefest story that Earl Woods, Tiger Woods' dad, right, is a green, was a Green Beret. And the Green Beret, if, if you think, were the, the guardians of the Treadstone Project which was, no, wait, it's not Treadstone, it was the... 
this is the strain all urine. Um, God, it's not Treadstone. That's from that movie, isn't it? It is. Um, what is, oh, now you're going to have to go look. You're going to have to go <laughs> move my picture. <laughs> Oh, it, oh, I'm sorry. Um, this was a CIA project where they would give people LSD in order to try to see if they would, uh, if they could, oh yeah, this is uh, MK Ultra. thank you, MK Ultra, which the CIA used in order to see if they could mind control people or people could, would not be able to give up secrets. If they can use this drug, to, and they experimented with all, this is a true thing, this is the true part. They experimented with all sorts of people with sensory deprivation, with acid, and all sorts of things uh, in MK Ultra. And so there's this conspiracy theory that's kind of like kind of conflating all these things of that actually Dr. Joseph Mengele didn't die in Argentina, that actually he was brought to the United States and put a China Lake weapon station and created a DNA way of creating DNA and that Ty Earl Woods gave Tiger Woods over to him to make a super athlete, super spy. <laughs> and that Tiger Woods, his brain was partitioned, like half of it was collecting secrets, like, like because he was, oh, you guys are doubting this? Uh, he was collecting secrets because he was moving in very powerful circles. And the other half was like, I'm Tiger Woods. I represent Buick, and I play golf. And they, he was a great athlete, so he could pay for his own way through this project. And it's all controlled by an uber master kind of guy. Because when his wife, Elaine, Ellen Nordgren, comes on the scene, she is his opposite number from Europe. And she's there to break him to get the secrets out of his partitioned mind. And she uses sex, like sex is a trauma producer. I don't know, so anyway, this whole thing, the reason why he crashed the car at the end is that she had given him sodium pentothal and got the secrets that she needed to get and split. And that's why Tiger, so this conspiracy theory, and people are, I was listening to a radio show, and people were super serious about this. So I included it at the end of my le last lecture. So that's why Tiger's there. That's, a, that's actually a wax from Madame Tussauds. There's Ellen, there's the porn star, there's more women. And there's his crashed caddy on the estate. Sorry, I'm, I'm really spinning out here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> give me some LSD and sex. <laughs> yeah, I think we should conclude. And any other questions? Thank you.